Hello, my name is Alex Wright. I'm the acting archivist here at St Andrews College, and today I have the pleasure of telling you something about the history of this place. I shall soon be talking to your daughters and sons about the pleasures and challenges of coming to live in an institution which has been around for a long time. I will be impressing upon them that this is not an environment to be taken for granted, that they should look around, ask questions, and see themselves as the heirs and custodians for a while of a century and a half of both tradition and change. Here, on our ten-acre oasis in the middle of the city, our glade in the subtropical jungle of modernity, is an idea as old as Plato debating with students in the Athenian gymnasium, older in fact. We believe that the education of minds is a communal, all-consuming activity, that it depends on putting people together to support and challenge each other in their thinking, sitting them down in the dining hall to break bread and prejudices, and to play together. After all, the test of a well-tempered mind is the ability to play gracefully with ideas. It hardly needs to be said, but St Andrews is the Scottish College of Sydney University. It was founded with an Act of Parliament in 1867 by Presbyterian immigrants and refugees who brought with them a profound respect for scholarship and hard work. We were to be a college of and within the University of Sydney, where students of all backgrounds could find residence and domestic supervision, and also efficient tutorial assistance. While we have all the Oxbridge apparatus of common rooms, bursars and fellows, uniquely among Sydney University's colleges, Andrew's origins are not in Oxford or Cambridge. The scholars and ministers who founded this place were educated in the ancient universities of Scotland and Germany, which did not have a concept of colleges. Therefore, when they established this place, it was an innovation. The ritual and grandeur of Oxbridge were less important than the egalitarian ambitions of the Scottish Enlightenment. This is one of the reasons there has never been a religious test for students at Andrew's. But first they had to raise the money. This is an extract from the original list of donors to the college, the first great treasure of the college. One-fifth of all Scottish families living in New South Wales in 1867 donated to the original college fund. Many of these 1,472 gifts were small, averaging just a few pounds. So great was their regard for education that poor families gave what they could in order to establish a home for higher learning and moral endeavour at Australia's first university. This debt of gratitude has not been forgotten, and from the outset, prosperous well-wishers have ensured that there were always ample funds to provide scholarships to allow students from whatever financial circumstances to attend university and live in college. We have always believed that education should be available to all who can benefit. In the porky idiom of Foundation Councillor, the Reverend Dr. Robert Steele, we keep the door eye on the snack that anyone who likes may enter. This promise was amply fulfilled by Mrs. Janet Coots, who left the college the equivalent of $2 million in 1914 to fund bursaries. And here is the college they built, in all its substantial majesty. We had a Scottish architect and a Scottish builder, and it shows. The college your daughters and sons are about to make their home away from home is one of the most important examples of the 19th century Scottish baronial style outside Britain. The central spire was only dismantled in 1936 when it began to sway a little too much in the wind. However, in 1890, the surging verticality of this tower house of enlightenment dominated the high ground of the university. Andrews was unique among Sydney colleges, for being the only one built with a purpose-built library from the beginning, though it is not always used for that purpose. This is the senior common room at one of our little dinner parties. In the library, the printed silk ceiling is one of only two in Australia, and by far the best. The initials and crests are those of the first college councillors. Also notice the possum and the koala. Ours are the first windows anywhere in the world to depict these animals in stained glass. The descendants of this possum still live in our green ten acres, waiting to ambush us in the evenings. As much as we might tell ourselves that we are founded on the principles of the Scottish Enlightenment, there are also romantic depths to the college's soul. 
When the foundations of St Andrews were laid, the moderator of the Presbyterian General Assembly and future principal, the Reverend Dr John Kinross, said the purpose of higher education must be to oppose with all her might the influence of the lowest and grossest form of utilitarianism, to cultivate the appreciation and expression of the beautiful. So it is all the more appropriate, then, that when students step through the main door of the college, they pass under the eyes of two great Scottish intellectuals, Adam Smith, the father of Enlightenment economics, and Thomas Carlyle, the great practitioner of romantic history. Since the foundation of the college, in these traditions, it has embodied 15 decades of student culture in Australia. The 19th century ethic of our second principal, John Kinross, led him to declare, St Andrew's College will never prove a refuge for indolence, luxury or intolerance, but all who are zealously pursuing the truth may find in it a congenial home. These students of Kinross's became eminent in many walks of public life, and as law and medicine became new faculties at the university, many budding lawyers and doctors were inmates. Since Andrews, unlike the other denominational colleges, conducted an independent theological hall from the beginning, most Presbyterian ministers in the state also owed their professional education to college. There have now been 12 principals, and only the last two have not been Presbyterian ministers. It is the antique joke of students to call the principal the bird. Naturally, his office is the bird cage, the lodge, the aviary. Here, the students of 1932 teased the avian Reverend Dr. Edward Anderson, a prolific and unrestrained gardener. The Trifford beset student shouts up, Fokker! The shrubbery's getting a little out of control down here. And the roosting Anderson replied in a Scottish brogue, Oh aye, but there's still room on the tower for pot plants. Between 1896 and 1902, the undergraduate students organised themselves into a fully representative body, the Students' Club. In 1906, the Students' Club was in full operation with a formal constitution and a house committee elected annually. For well over a century now, the House Committee has been a fiercely independent advocate for student needs and for the College. It still retains substantial organisational, budgetary and disciplinary responsibilities. As we move into the 20th century, we also produced our fair share of notorious communists and distinguished judges. During the 1920s, our residents protested against the conservatism of Sydney University and in the 1940s and 50s, were leading the eccentric life of students, debating such momentous questions as, is polygamy desirable in wartime? Rather poignantly in the age of coronavirus, when the Spanish flu struck in 1919, the reading room was turned into a makeshift hospital for all the sick students. That year, the flu killed more people globally than the entire First World War. But there has always been a sense of fun and vigour in the lives of students. Here are some likely lads in costume for a Gilbert and Sullivan operetta. And here is a photo of the famed horse race of 1920, with the jockeys in their jaunty silks. In the middle of the century, Andrews turned out some formidable athletes, as it has continued to do, and filled the ranks of many a Wallaby's team. At the same time, the college also founded one of the oldest continuously running theatre groups in Australia, named, in an Orwellian turn of phrase, Dramsock. It was inaugurated in 1953 with George Bernard Shaw's Pygmalion by the future international tennis champion and founding producer of the ABC's play school, Alan Kendall. In 1944, before the Purple Testament of Bleeding War had been closed, the College Council was already planning for the future. They foresaw a college of 400 residents and laid out master plans for building developments. It was this vision which gave us Reed Building in 1953. This photo from about 1960 shows Reed in relation to the Third Principal's Lodge, which was demolished to make way for the Oval. Its gate still exists in the wall of Carillion Avenue. Fine Building followed in 1965, and, 76 years later, we now approach the number they foresaw in 1944. 
This demonstrates the ever-shifting character of the place, always evolving, always changing, while we cleave to the core values of education and enlightenment. The close of the 20th century saw many changes in Andrews. After the Uniting Church was formed in the 1970s, the college chose to remain with the continuing Presbyterians, but this was no longer so broad a Kirk. The college endured a wounding heresy trial in 1993, when the orthodoxy of the 10th principal, the Reverend Dr. Peter Cameron, was challenged after he pre preached a vigorous and witty sermon in which he argued that women should continue to be ordained as Presbyterian ministers and criticised the church's hard line against homosexuality. In the wake of Dr. Cameron's conviction, and because of changes in society, Andrews moved to amend its founding act of Parliament in 1998. This change opened the way for women to enter the college as undergraduates, cut exclusive ties with the Presbyterian Church, and removed the requirement that the principal be an ordained minister. While there had long been women residents in college, since the matriculation of female undergraduates in 2002, Andrews has entered a new cultural era. This progress coincided with the 21st century renaissance in college, which has seen a renewed academic focus while music and other creative arts have been fated alongside sport. The more recent campaign for cultural renewal, some of it focused on the 2017 Broderick Review, has ensured that college has maintained its progressive momentum. As we come up to the present day, the dairy cars may have vanished from the college oval, and 1960s brutalism has joined the soaring Gothic verticality of main building. But Andrews remains a rich amalgam of cultural and intellectual legacies. It is for our students, your sons and daughters today, to make their own contributions and shape the next 150 years of college history in our founding traditions of philanthropy, liberalism, and intellectual rigor. We have much to be hopeful about.